بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد حياكم الله ما بعد It's a great honor for us to have the opportunity to come to the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to pray here to be a part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to come to his mosque, to pray the place where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray, to have the chance to get the great reward that a person get when he prays, and when he prays specifically in this mosque. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in many a hadith about the reward of praying. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even told us that for every single sujood that we do, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us, take us closer to Him and take away sins from us. And especially if we pray in the mosques. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that one prayer in a mosque it's equivalent to 25 or 27 prayers in another, uh, in, that if you pray in your house or uh, in the market. And especially if we pray in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that one prayer in this mosque is equivalent to 1,000 prayers in another mosque. So it's a great blessing for us, great honor for us, that we can pray, that we can pray in a mosque, and especially that we pray in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And it's a great honor for us to sit down in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to teach his his companions, and that we can sit here and study and learn about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Today. I will start to teach a new book. It's called Sharh Usul al-Iman, which it's a book about the basic principles of the Islamic creed. And the Islamic creed is the most important subject that we can study, especially about Tawheed. Because Tawheed is the knowledge about Allah Azza wa Jal. And there can be nothing that is better to study than to study about Allah Azza wa Jal. To study about Allah Azza wa Jal's names and His attributes and to study about how we can come closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the creed also includes the study about the angels. And they are some of the best creations that Allah Azza wa Jal have created. And the creed also includes the study about the holy books, the scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. And the study about the messengers from Adam alayhi salam and the prophets from Adam alayhi salam to our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's all part of the creed. And to study about the last day, to study about paradise, about hellfire, and so on, and to study about Qadr. These are the most important subjects that we can study and that we can learn about. Because when we study about that, it will open up the door for us to practice the religion more. Because in accordance to our knowledge about the Islamic creed, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the angels and the messengers and the scriptures, the last day and so on. In accordance to our knowledge about that, it will have a great effect on our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of the messengers agreed upon calling people to Tawheed. That was the most basic message that they called people to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ We have not sent 
any messenger before you except that we reveal to him that there is no deity worthy of worship except me, so worship me. This is the basic message. If you read about the stories about Nuh alayhi salam, Hud, Salih, and Ibrahim, and Musa, what was the core of their message? What was the basic of their message? All of them started their message when they came to their people to say, Ya qawmi abudullah, ma lakum min illahin ghayru. O oh my people, worship Allah. You don't have any other deity besides Him. So this is the basic of the foundation of their call. This is what they put emphasis on. And also if we read the Qur'an, from the beginning to the end, we will see that most of the Qur'an is about this subject. Let me give you an example. If you read Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Fatiha starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's about three of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. Allah, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. That's the knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. And then Allah says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That's also about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and His attributes, and that He is the one that we worship and that we praise. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, one more time. Maliki Yawmiddin, that's also about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. Iyyaka na'abudu wa iyyaka nasta'een. It means that Allah Azzawajal is the only one worthy of worship. Ihdina al-shirat al-mustaqeem. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be on the straight path. That's also a dua. It's based on our belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hadi, the one who guides. So we search guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek guidance from Allah Azzawajal. This is the beginning of the Qur'an, when we read in the Mus'haf. And the same thing, if we start with Surah Al-Baqarah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, Thalik al-Kitab la rayba fi, the first verse is about what? It's about the scripture, about the book. And this is one of the basic tenets of the faith in Islam, the creed. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب. What is the first attribute of those who get guided of that book? Those who believe in the unseen, in al ghayb And that's also part of the creed. And this is the case when we continue to read the Qur'an until the end. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس it's all about Tawheed, or the creed. And we can see, when we really reflect upon that, how important it is for us to study and to learn about the basics and foundations of the Islamic religion. The Islamic religion is very special in many ways. From the ways that it makes it very special is that it's a completed religion. It's complete from every single way. It's complete in its creed. It's complete in its worship and how we treat others and so on. It's a complete religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اليَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Today I have completed and perfected your religion for you. So the religion is complete. We can see other religions, that they put emphasis on some aspects. Some religions speak about the spiritual side. Some religions speak about rituals. Some religions speak about uh, ethics and morals and so on. But Islam has everything. Islam... It's about creed, Islam is spiritual, Islam teaches us how to clean ourselves, Islam teaches us how to treat one another, 
how to treat our parents, how to t- treat our kids, how everything. It's a complete religion. And also, Islam is very special because it's the only religion that is accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الْإِسْلَامِ Verily, the religion that Allah Azza wa accepts is an Islam. It's the only religion that Allah Azza wa accepts. If a person would worship Allah for a hundred years in accordance to another religion, that would not be accepted from him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَيْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ That whoever wants another religion than Islam, then it will be not, not be accepted from him, and he will be from the losers in the next life. Islam is a religion that is suitable for every time and every age. Every time and every place. We can see that we sit here today 1,400 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he used to sit here, he used to teach, and we live today in the modern world. The dunya, the world has changed, but we can still practice Islam. Islam is still suitable. And not only for people living here in the Arabic Peninsula. You who sit at the lesson today are from different parts of the world, different countries. Islam can be, can be implemented here in the Arabic Peninsula and in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, in Americas, and so on. Islam is suitable for every place and every time. Islam is built on five pillars. And the first pillar of Islam is a shahadatain. Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That we bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, is the messenger of Allah. As we can see in the shahada, the shahadatain, that it's actually two sentences, but it's one pillar. And the reason for that is that a shahadatain is the basis for every action that we do. It's the basis for every action that we do. Because if we want to do an action, and it's going to be accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we have to live up to two conditions. That we have sincerity for the sake of Allah. We only do the action for the sake of Allah. Which is the meaning of la ilaha illallah. That we only worship Allah. We don't do our actions for the sake of others. We do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we pray, we don't pray to show up for others. We pray to make Allah Azza wa Jal pleased. We don't give zakat for so others can praise us and they can write about us and so on. No. We give it for the sake of Allah to help others because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us with that. And we fast for the sake of Allah and so on. So Islam is based on two pillars. That we do it for the sincerity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the action, and that we do it in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is the meaning of, wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. So even if we have sincerity for the sake of Allah, but we don't do the action in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then it won't be accepted. If someone would say, I have my own form of worship, I will sit down on this chair here and I will worship Allah in my own way. Some kind of yoga thing or meditation or something. I do it for the sake of Allah. Say no, that's not accepted from you. 
unless you do it in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, I want to pray. Then pray in, the, in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Sallu kama raaytu muni wa salli." Pray as you have seen me pray. This is how we should pray, in accordance to the sunnah, and not in accordance to how we want to pray ourselves. And the second pillar is the prayer. And we can see that in the Qur'an, when Allah Azza wa Jalla orders us with prayer, He usually say, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish the prayer. It does not say pray. So the second pillar is to establish the prayer and not only to pray. There's a difference between them. Iqamat al-salah, establishing the prayer, means that you pray in accordance to the conditions of the prayer. You pray in accordance to the pillars, the obligatory elements, and you even try to do things that are sunnah. This is how we pray. We can't pray in our own way. We have to pray in accordance to the Islamic message. And when a person prays, he can feel tranquility inside of his soul. Subhanallah, we can do many things in our lives, can make us feel happy, can laugh and so on. But the thing that really gives us tranquility in our souls is the prayer. Just feel the difference when you go out there in the market, around people, and when you're praying here, especially in the mosque, and especially in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the tranquility that we feel, the happiness that we feel in our life, in our souls, it's just something different, different. And also the prayer, one of the good effects of the prayer is that it hinders us from doing bad things. Because if a person really prays his five daily prayers, and also tries to pray the sunan, and he knows that after two hours there will be a new prayer, after three hours, five hours, there will be a new prayer. This will affect him. This will affect him. To stay away from doing bad things. Because you feel shy. Do you know that after a while, I'm going to stand one more time in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I will pray. This is if we really pray with concentration and sincerity. But if a person just pray out of tradition, doesn't really think and reflect upon what he's saying, that that might not affect him so much. And the third pillar is to give zakat. Islam is incredible, subhanAllah. That one of the pillars, the basic tenets of Islam is to help others. Is to help others in need. What does it say about our religion? If this is one of the pillars, what is recommended after that? To give charity. Or you can even see in some statistical reports that they mention that those who give most in charity in different countries are Muslims. And those who give least in charity are atheists. Why? Because the atheist, he just thinks that he will live in this dunya. There's no life after that. And he's a materialist. The most important thing in his life are material things. So why should he give to others? Why should he send his money to another country, to someone else over there? And you can usually see that atheists, if they give charity, they want something back. They want to take a picture when they give uh, when they give charity, so people can see and praise them. They give through their company, so their company might get some benefits in other countries and so on. This is, in many cases, their intention. But look at Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised those who give charity with their right hand, so the left hand doesn't even know about it. 
you, tr- you give zakah, you give a sadaqah, charity, to help others without people knowing. You can do it sometimes so people knows if you want other people to give too. But you should never give charity so people will praise you. The only reason you can give charity openly is that other persons will give charity too. They say, okay, I see that person is giving charity, I will give charity too. But to give charity for the sake of others, that people will praise you, and they will say, oh, look at that person. He's very generous, then that's not allowed in Islam. You do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also fasting in Islam. Islam teaches us to fast a month a year. And it's a way for us to reload our batteries. Because all of us can get weak in faith. And then Ramadan comes and we fast every day. We pray at night. You give more charity, you do more good deeds, you read more Qur'an, you go to the mosque and so on, more than you used to do before. So you reload your batteries, so you get out stronger for the rest of the year. And then you can feel weaker, then Ramadan comes one more time and so on. So Ramadan is incredible for us, an incredible chance to reload our batteries, Iman batteries. And also, Hajj. It's extremely beautiful with Hajj. How people all around the world, from different countries, join for one sake, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the house that was built by prophets and messengers, solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see millions of people joining together, sit down and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. It's incredible. It's a very, very beautiful thing. You can see that even non-Muslims, when they see that, they get really impressed. And it's also incredible how you can see that all people, they wear the same clothes. All men, they wear the same clothes. A king, a president, a farmer, a person that is very poor, a person that is very rich, all of them wear the same clothes. Because in the end of the day, we're all going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And Allah azza wa will ask us for our deeds. There will be no one that is over the other one except with taqwa on the day of judgment. Allah azza wa will say, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَحَارِ who is the king today on the day of judgment? It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the rest, they will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will be asked, لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألون. Allah azza wa will not be asked for what he did, but they will be asked. We will be asked. We stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this book, Sharh Usul al-Iman, the main subject of this book is the six pillars of faith. And I will today speak about two of the pillars, and I will see if I have a chance to speak about the other pillars too. The first pillar is the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the belief of Allah in Allah Azzawajal is based on four pillars. There are four basic things that we have to believe in when it comes to our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first pillar is our belief in the existence of Allah azza wa jal. The second pillar is our belief in the lordship of Allah azza wa jal, that He is the only creator and the only sustainer and the one that controls everything. The third pillar is our faith in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. And the fourth pillar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship. 
Let's speak about the first pillar. The belief in the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is a very broad subject. And it's a very important subject, especially in our age. Why? Because in many, many countries, atheists have a lot of power. They have power over institutions, educational institutions, over media, over social media. And they spread their doubts about this issue. If we would go back 200 years ago, 300 years ago, you would not find atheists. You would find the people either Christians or Jews or Muslims or Hindus and so on. But the modern atheism that we have today actually started about 250 years ago. So this is something new. But atheists have gained a lot of power in many different ways. So they spread their doubts to our kids, to our youths, and even to grown-ups. Through television, through newspapers, through the education system, through social media, and so on. And if a person really follows these things, social media and the media and so on, he will get bombarded with different thoughts that are either atheistic or close to atheism. Very secular thoughts. That either makes a person what is called a metaphysical atheist, that he does not believe in a creator, or a practical atheist, that he will live his life as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not exist. He does only care about this worldly life, the material things. That's the only thing that is important. So that's why it's important for us to speak about this issue in our age. If it would be 250 years ago, that would have been important, because people are not atheists. But today, it's important to speak about that subject. The author mentioned four basic evidences for the existence of the Creator. There are, of course, many, many more than that. Actually, every single creation is an evidence for the Creator. Every single atom is an evidence for a Creator. Because everything that is created has to have a Creator. If someone would say to me, say, you know, this glass, it started to exist by itself. It started to exist by itself. It just came about by itself one day. One day in this mosque, just popped up like this. If someone would say that, you would either laugh, or you would say, are you stupid? If you would say that to an atheist, he would say, no, 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 that's impossible. Say to him, okay, would it be possible for this microphone to exist? No, 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 but by itself, no, 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 that's impossible. Okay, what do you say about the whole earth? Yeah, that's possible. The sun, yeah, that's possible. The moon, yeah, that's possible. This, they came about by themselves. There's no creator there. Okay, how can you think that it's impossible for a glass that's impossible that it was created by itself, came about by itself. But this is possible for the earth and the moon, animals, human beings. Of course, that's even more impossible. So everything actually points to a creator. But you can summarize the evidences with four evidences. The first thing is what is called the fitra, inside of every human being. We are all born with a belief in a creator, or an inclination to a belief in a creator. And we can actually see that with human beings all around the world, throughout history, that they have believed in a supreme being, 
or the divine. It's not just something that happened here amongst Arabs, the Arabic Peninsula. You would see the same thing if you would go to South America, North America, to Asia, to Australia, to Europe. This is in, uh, embedded in human nature, to believe in the divine. There are actually studies about that. Anthropological studies, psychological studies. The Oxford University conducted a big study a couple of years ago. They had scholars from different countries, different universities that cooperated to study people all around the world and even studying children, small children, about the basic belief, whether they came from a Muslim family or atheistic family or Christian family. What is the basic belief in kids? What is the basic belief in human beings? And if you would search in Google, you would say belief in God is part of human nature, you would see that study. This is the conclusion. Belief in God is part of human nature. And this is something that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about 1,400 years ago. When he said, ما من مولود إلا يولد على الفطرة There is no newborn child except that he is born on the fitra. The inclination or belief in a creator. This is part of human nature. And that's why common people don't even need an evidence for a creator because it's part of their human nature. And that's why even atheists, they can say that it's pretty hard for them sometimes to be atheists because it's against their basic human nature. Like I said, you speak to them, you say, okay, what about this glass, what about that, what about that? How can you believe that this whole universe came about by itself? The sun, the earth, the moon, the stars, the galaxies. How can you believe that? Usually what they do, start to speak about other subjects. Say, oh, you Muslims, uh, you are terrorists. So to speak about another subject. No, 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 I'm not speaking about that. Let me speak to you about this subject right now. We started to try to flee away from these basic existential questions. So the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually a part of human nature. And also, like I said, sound intellect, if we use our rational thinking, then it's very easy to come to that conclusion. Because everything that started to exist needs a creator. Nothing, out of nothing, nothing comes. They say, ex nihilo nihil fit in Latin. Out of nothing, nothing comes. If you have nothing, then out of that nothing, nothing comes. If something starts to exist, it needs a creator. That's what's called the evidence of creation. And you also speak about the evidence of design. We can see the difference between things that are designed and things that happen by chance. If we would go to the beach, and you would see some sand and some sticks on the beach in a chaotic way, you would say probably it came about by the waves from the sea because it's chaotic. But if you would see a sand castle, it's built in a designed way, then you would say that it has to be someone that designed it. Because if something is organized, something is designed, then it needs a designer. If something is chaotic then it may have happened by chance. You can say, if you go by an old house, and you saw that the windows are broken, you might say 
This is a very old house. And it might have happened by chance. By someone throw a rock. He did not attend it. Or it was a tornado or something. But if you would go the next day to the very house, and you would see that all of the windows are fixed. All of the windows are fixed. Would you say it just happened by chance? Maybe it was the wind. Maybe it was the sun. Maybe it just happened like that. No, you would say, no, 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 no. This is organized. This is designed. Someone made that. This has to have a designer. Because things that are organized, things that are designed, needs a designer. Okay, what do we see around us? What do we see around us? The stars, the sun, the moon, the atoms. Even the atoms are extremely, perfectly organized and designed. The human cells, the human cells are more complex complex than factories. DNA are more complex than computer programs. This is not something that happened by chance. This needs a creator. And another evidence that you can use is that you can see the Holy Scriptures, especially the Qur'an. The message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you really read about the Qur'an, and you read about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can understand that he did not know these things by himself. This is not something that he knew by himself. It's impossible that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wrote the Quran by himself. This has to be a revelation. This has to come from a supernatural creator. And the Quran, if we read that, tells us about Allah subhanahu wa taala and the existence of Allah azza wa jal. So the Holy Scripture itself is an evidence for a supernatural creator. And also our senses, our senses, that someone makes dua and Allah is the answers the dua. You have a problem in your life, you raise your hands, you ask Allah and you get the specific thing that you asked for. You get that specific thing that you asked for. If someone would say that it happened to one person, one time in history, he might say, might have happened by chance. But if it's not one person in history, and not two, and not three, and not hundred, and not thousand, and not millions, people all around the world throughout history, they turned to the Creator, they asked Him, and they got what they asked for. This is a proof that someone answering your prayer. Someone might say, but there are people, they ask Allah as Zawajal and they don't get what they want. It is true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give every single person the specific thing that he wants. That's true. We never, no one ever said that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give to whoever wants and can refuse to give to whoever he wants. But that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give some people is not an evidence against his existence. You can say that it's a very rich person. Take an analogy. A very rich person. He got money. Ten persons come to him and he gives them. He thinks that they deserve to get money. They are very poor and they have a specific situation that he should give them. Then five other persons, they come and he knows that they don't deserve to get money. They don't deserve to get the things they ask for. For different reasons. 
maybe they have money, maybe he knows that they will use the money for drugs, for, uh, for bad things. So he does not give them. Can they say that this rich person does not exist because he does not give them? No, he did not give them because maybe they did not deserve it. And this is the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He gives whoever He wants because they deserve it. He thinks that they deserve it from His blessings, His mercy. And some others, He does not give them, and it can be different reasons for that. And also, the different miracles that have happened. These are also things that people could see. Supernatural events. And this is not something that happened one time. This is something that happened many times throughout history. Supernatural events. And this is actually a big problem for atheists. Because atheists are not only saying that they are not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are also materialists. They say that the only thing that exists is material things, things that you can take, things that you can see with your eyes and so on. But there are many supernatural events that happens. Miracles. Things that are above the natural things, the material things, and so on. But we can see that the messengers and the prophets they had many different miracles that they came with. And even their followers, those who follow the messengers, they also have what is called karamat and awliya. They can do different supernatural things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with. And these are all evidences for the existence of a creator. And there are many different evidences that we can mention, but these are just some of them. These are just some of them. This and other evidence, I really like it. It's what is called Dalil al-Hidayah. The evidence of guidance. The evidence of guidance. We can see that animals all around the world, they are guided to things that helps them in their lives. Things that they need. You can see a bird starts to fly. He knows how to fly. He didn't go to school. He didn't study how to fly. But he has something inside of it that guides it, not only to fly, but to fly to the places that they need. You can have pigeons. You can send them with letters to other places. And they will come back to you, to the same place. There's a specific bird that flies from Alaska to New Zealand. That's about 13,000 kilometers or 11,000 kilometers, something like that. More than 10,000 kilometers. Through the Pacific Ocean. Flies for a single week without stopping, without eating, without drinking. Just flies. It's about this size. And then it lands on the place that it wants, then it goes up, and then it returns to Alaska. Who guides it? Who gives it instructions how to know where to go? We, as human beings, could use Google Maps. Even maybe Google Maps doesn't work when you're out in the sea. But they don't have it. There's someone guiding them. Who is guiding them? Who's guiding the fishes? Who's guiding the different animals to the things that they need. They are all evidences for a creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second pillar regarding the, our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the belief in his rububiyyah, his lordship, that he is the only creator. He is the one that controls everything, that owns everything. Everything is under His will. Everything is under His power and His might. Just look at this incredible universe. The planets, the stars, how they go in different orbits. 
just look at the earth, how it's up there in space, how it rotates, goes around. It's incredible. What kind of power and might is behind that? It's all under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the might of Allah azza wa jal. He's the one who created everything and controls everything in universe. And this is what is called Tawheed ar rubiyyah That we believe that Allah azza wa is the only one that creates and the only one that controls. You can see other religions like Hinduism, they mention that they believe in 330 million gods. 330 million gods. They worship all different things. Can worship cows, can worship rats. They have their own temples with rats. Their own temple with rats. And they pray to the rats. And they try to seek blessings from the rats and so on. Believe in different gods that controls the universe and so on. This is what is called shirk. Shirk. And it's actually an impossibility. Because if we look at the universe, we see extreme order. Not only in the universe, even on a small scale. Even inside of the atoms, the electrons are going around in its orbit. In a perfectly designed way. We see order. We don't see chaos. And they describe it as this God fought this God, and then this one killed this God, and there was a new God that was born. It's like everything is chaotic. This is not what we see. If that God would want the moon to go around and the other God, what would happen? This is not what we see. We see that everything is under the power of the one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third pillar is the belief that Allah is Zawajal is not only the, the only creator, He is also the only one worthy of worship. Because some people, they believe that it's one creator, but they worship others. That was actually the case with the Arabs in Jahiliyyah. They did not believe that the heavens and the earth was created by different creators. They say, no, there's only one creator. Allah is the creator. It's mentioned in the Quran. If you would ask them, if you would ask the polytheists, who created the heavens and the earth, they would say Allah. What was the problem? They say that if we want to come close to Allah, we have to have mediators. Someone who mediate between us and Allah. مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ الزُّلْفَةِ Like Allah Azza wa told us about them. We only worship them so they can take us closer to Allah. وَيَقُولُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَاءُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Like it's also mentioned in the Quran. They say that they mediate. So, I do not pray to Allah straight away because He's the Creator. I pray to Allah, Uzza, Manat, Hubal, and so on, so they can mediate to Allah. And they, they, then they mention different beliefs that they have, that they are the daughters of God, and so on. But the main problem that they had was in Al-Uluhiyyah. They worshipped others than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They prayed to them, they slaughtered to them, and gave different oaths to them, and so on. Seeked blessings from them. They took different stones and trees and so on. And they say that they can find blessings from them and so on. And these are all things that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about and that he uh, called them away from. And we can see in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned different evidences against them. Why we cannot worship 
these so-called semi-gods that they used to believe in. One of the things is that they don't have any attributes of divinity. They can't even help themselves. وَاتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ آلِهَةً لَا يَخْلُقُونَ شَيْئًا وَهُمْ يُخْلَقُونَ وَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ ضَرًّا وَلَا نَفْعًا وَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ مَوْتًا وَلَا حَيَاةً وَلَا نُشُورًا They took other gods, the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these gods did not create anything, rather they are themselves created. They don't own anything for themselves. They cannot help themselves, they cannot hurt themselves, they cannot give life, they cannot take life, and they cannot resurrect anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the polytheists in this verse that this is just stupid. How can you worship them? They are themselves created. They can help you. They even take their statues with them when they're traveling. The, st- the statues can't walk by themselves. They have to take the statues with them and put them in different places. They have to protect them. That's the same thing that we can see in some countries where they have shirk, polytheism. Why do many Hindus get so angry at Muslims when they're eating cows? Say you're eating our gods. Okay, but how could they slaughter them? How could you slaughter, how could you eat them if they are gods? This is insane. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us in this verse that they don't have any attributes of divinity. And also that they themselves used to say that Allah is is the only creator. Okay, if Allah is the only creator, the one who controls everything, everything is under his power. He's the one that takes life, gives life. He's the one that nurtures you. Why do you worship anyone else? This is just stupid. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ عُبُدُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O people, worship your Lord who has created you and those who came before you. This is the first time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an says, if we read the Mus'haf, that He says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ He orders us with something. O people, عُبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ Worship your Lord who created you and created those before you. This is the main message of Islam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship. And then the fourth pillar is the belief in the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we read the Quran, we'll see that Allah is already mentioned many of His names and His attributes. Like I said in the beginning of Surah Al-Fatiha, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim That's three of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And when we read the Qur'an, from the beginning to the end, we'll see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned many of His names, and also many of His attributes. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in a hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names. If we make ihsa of these names, لِلَّهِ تِسَعَ وَتِسْعِينَ إِسْمًا مَنْ أَحْصَاهَا دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ If we make ihsa, like the Prophet ﷺ said in Arabic, of these names will come to paradise. And the meaning of ihsa here is that we memorize 99 of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. We learn about their meanings. We understand the meanings of these names. What's the meaning of the name Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Salam, Al-Mu'min, Al-Muhim, Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbar, and so on. What are the meanings of these names? And the third thing that we have to do is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance to these names. We really worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, the, in accordance to the belief that He is Al-Alim. He knows everything. al samia He hears everything. al basir he sees everything. That He is al ghafur al-Rahim, so we seek His mercy, His forgiveness, His tawab 
So we turn to him, ask for Tawbah. He said, Mannan al Murti, he's the one that gives, Al Razak, and so on. We worship Allah Azza wa Jal in accordance to the belief in these names. If we do that, we'll come to paradise. So it's extremely important that we learn about the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it will have a great effect on our faith. So these are the four things that we have to believe in when it comes to our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The belief in the existence of Allah, the belief in Allah's rububiyyah, His Lordship, that He's the only Creator, that everything is under the will and the might and the power of Allah Azza wa Jal, that Allah Azza is the only one worthy of worship, and we believe in the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second pillar that's been mentioned is the belief in the angels. The angels. And the angels are creation from the unseen. They are created from light. We can't see them usually. Sometimes people can see angels. But usually we don't see them. They are around us. They are with us. Every person has many angels with him. As angels that protects him. As angels that writes down his good deeds and his bad deeds and so on. There are different angels. There are even angels that comes to these kind of gatherings, these kind of sittings. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَ لَتَضَعَ أَجْنِحَتَهَا عَلَى طَالِبِ عِلْمِ رِضًا لِمَا يصنع. The angels, they will put their wings down on the students of knowledge because they are pleased with what they're doing. And they come to these kind of gatherings. We don't see them, but they're around us. They're with us. All of the time. And this is something incredible. The belief in the angels is based on different things. The first thing is the belief in their existence. We believe that there are many, many, many angels. Billions of billions of angels. We don't know how many there are. The only one who knows how many there are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur has 70,000 angels that come there every day. And they never return. So you can just think every day, 70,000, 70,000, 70,000. Every single human being has angels with him and so on. So there are much more angels than there are human beings. So we believe in their existence. And we also believe in their names. The names that we knew about, that we learned about through Revelation. Jibreel, Mikael, Israfil, and so on. Malik al Maut. We believe in their names. We don't know the names of most of them. We know the names of some of the angels. The most mighty of them, like Jibreel, alayhi salam. And we believe in their attributes. If we read the Quran, and we read the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them with different attributes. They have wings that they write down, things and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, described Jibreel alayhi salam that he had 600 wings when he saw him. We believe in all of these attributes that have been mentioned in the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the fourth thing is that we believe in their actions, what they do, the things that have been mentioned. What does Jibreel do? He's responsible for the revelation 
to come with the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers. He was the one that came with revelation not only to Prophet sallallahu but also the other messengers. And this is uh, the most virtuous deed that an angel can ever do. And we also believe in Mikael, who is the angel responsible for the rain, for the raining. Israfil, who is the angel responsible for blowing in the trumpet when the day of judgment will start. Believe in Malik al the angel that is responsible for taking the souls of human beings. And we believe in the angels that are responsible for uh, babies inside of the wombs. And there are angels responsible for writing down our deeds, our actions. And there are angels responsible for asking people in the graves, as we mentioned, when you are in the grave, two angels comes, Munkar wa Nakir, and they ask, who is your Lord? Who, what is your religion? Who is your prophet? And so on. So the angels, they do different things, different actions, and so on. And the belief in the angels has many fruits. It affects our faith. If we have a strong belief in the angels. One of the things is that we really, when we reflect upon the attributes and the actions that they have been described with, we can understand their might. And we can understand the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they are all servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that He orders them with, they do it. And if you reflect upon that, you just feel Allahu Akbar, subhanallah. When rain comes and all these things that happens, every single human beings, they, uh, human being, they have angels that protects them, that writes down their deeds and so on, shows us the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, it makes us thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He creates angels for every single human being, that we have angels that write down our good deeds and also our bad deeds. Shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of His creation. And also, it leads us to the love of the angels themselves. That we love the angels themselves. Jibreel alayhi salam, that he came down with the revelation to all of the prophets before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came down with the Quran. You can read the story about when the revelation came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the first time. They came to him with the verse, Iqra. Bismi Rabbika alladhi khalaq, and so on. And also, that he used to come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and teach him verses of the Qur'an and also other things. That he even participated in the battle of Badr, and so on. That he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here in Medina. And this is something that is special when you hear in Medina. And when you read the different stories about the, the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, most of the things, most of the ahadith where the Prophet sallallahu spoke about things, happened here in Medina. There are some ahadith that tells stories about what happened in Mecca, but most of the things related to uh, worship and so on, there are things that happen here in the very place we're in now. And one of the things is that Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him different questions. The famous hadith of Jibreel. We asked him about Islam, about Iman, about Ihsan, and so on. That he came 
to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Sahaba they saw him. They saw him. So these are things that, if we reflect upon them, we read these verses, these are hadith. It makes us love the angels too. And I really recommend all of you to read more about this subject. Read more, especially about faith of Allah, uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about His names and His attributes, and that He is the only one worthy of worship. The beliefs of the existence of Allah, the evidences for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially in our age where atheism is spreading, and also the belief in the angels. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله